the most famous commune in India today. 27 acres of lush parklands, shaded walks and outdoor restaurants. More than 85,000 people a year come here to learn about the teachings of the late Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh, or Osho as he's now known. The most controversial of all the Indian mystics since the 60s, labelled by some the sex guru. Well, this place is all about getting in touch with your feelings. But I knew absolutely nothing about this place when I came here. The two days before I came, a friend called me up and said, you know, oh my God, it's all about free sex, that's all it is, blah, blah, blah. And let me tell you, not one man has approached me here. I mean, men did approach me anywhere in the world, actually. I no, I swear, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not approachable, though I know that. So, um, and I'm thrilled. I'm absolutely thrilled that that side is not true. I mean, it's not relevant, it's not important, it doesn't seem... I mean, of course people are having fun, I hope they are, I hope people are having a wonderful time, but it's not the goal, it's not the aim of this place at all. It's not, you know, the free love and all that. It's not, it's all about meditation. Yeah, but you just don't wake up one morning and say, I've got to go and meditate, my ego's too big. Or well, you do. I mean, I think it was a, it's, an, it's a thing that grew inside me. I mean, I think that I've always been a sort of slightly... I don't want, I want, they want to call myself spiritual. That sounds like I might be enlightened, which is the, the last thing I know I am. But um, I I'm, was a very sensitive child, and I just was... I'm a very sensitive person, I think, and, and sometimes things can just get too much for you. And you just know you just want to change certain aspects of your life. His followers call him the most dangerous man since Jesus Christ, never born, never died. But his spirit lives on, enshrined in the marble and crystal glitter dome of his home. Anando is one of the keepers of the flame. I suppose it's difficult, if you look at it from the outside, to imagine a man of great spirituality luxuriating in a, a marble bath and having all this opulence. I mean, it's always been one of the kind of criticisms, hasn't it? I know, but it's, it's also been one of the things, like from traditional religion, that one has to be, it's this whole thing that religion is imposed on us, is that we have to deny ourselves. And that's been one of his big things, is to break that whole thing, that, that whole conditioning of you have to suffer and be miserable. Miserable? During the early 80s, when he led his followers to a commune in Oregon, he had 93 Rolls Royces. He was actually leaning on his Rolls Royce at the time, and he said, I think there was a reporter there, and he said, I'm a man of simple taste. I just like the best of everything. <laughs> <laughs> this really is a very wealthy commune. Copies of his books have sold more than 15 million worldwide. Even though he's no longer in his body, Osho is widely regarded as being one of India's most original thinkers. He certainly inspired Amrito, a British doctor, and one of the commune's leading lights. It was his birthday, and everybody lined up to walk past Osho, who's sitting in his chair, and everyone's walking past, some people namaste, some people just smile and nod, some people would prostrate themselves. And here I am, just as you say, a GP from Lewisham in the queue walking past. And for me, it was suddenly the most natural thing in the world to bow down and kiss this man's foot. Everyone else you meet in the world, you shake their hand, they smile at you. There's some social contract in process, especially if they're famous people, they enjoy being made to feel more famous because you're providing ever more fuel for their ego, nothing. A, a certain absence, an emptiness, yet a total delight in that emptiness was just... There was an individual like I had never seen before. This is a business, it's a big business. Isn't there a danger that you begin to lose the balance between the spirituality of what he had to say and what perhaps one can learn from sitting at his feet? Well... Uh, and this big 20th century kind of industry. Religion. I mean, no, I'd, I mean, you're drawing the distinction. You're using the word industry and marketing. I wouldn't use that word at all. And Osho would, in every way, 
object to this splitting of life into the spiritual and the non-spiritual, the sacred and the profane. You need to be rich on the inside, you need to be rich on the outside. That's his basic understanding. He does not support the idea that you're rich on the inside but live in poverty and walk around with a loincloth. He does not support the idea that you're rich on the outside and totally ignore the inside. He wants both for everybody. I do feel good in this place, but there again it's hard not to. They call it Club Med, meditation. Sir Hodge is a London stockbroker whose day-to-day -day life is all about profit and loss. If you're sitting behind a computer doing whatever else you do, making money in the city, um, it, you know, one would think of going up the road to a health farm, but going to India to a commune, I mean, were you always, did you have a kind of a spiritual hole in your life or something that you realized was missing? Last year I had various problems with my own personal life. And I started meditating anyway by myself in a normal way. And I then met up with some people in London from the Osho Commune. And I got to meditating with them and got to like it and find it was doing me a great deal of good. Did you ever imagine yourself wandering out in, in a maroon robe? No. Not at all. I mean, I'm being very obvious about oh. this, but is that whole sort of, you know, I can see you in your city suit. And, and, uh, well, after all, the city suit is some form of uniform. I was in the army for 10 years. I was, it's a form of uniform. So, in, in a way, it's not strange, but I never imagined this particular type of uniform. Yeah. What, what about your friends and family? I mean, um, what, how do they regard this? Is, do they regard this as a sudden burst of eccentricity or something? Or? Um, old age creeping I think, on. <laughs> I think a lot of my friends in the city do. I mean, they, they, they all said, what are you doing for Christmas? And I said, I'm going to, going to India. And they said, you're going to stay with some Maharaja or something. I said, no, I'm going to Pune to meditate. It's a good, good conversation stopper. It's the nightly ritual, much white robe dancing in praise of Osho and meditating within the Buddha Hall. India seems to bring out the spiritual in most travellers, or at least a feeling that something might be missing in their lives. If shaking hands with the Dalai Lama, going to bed with Krishna, or waving at Osho's empty chair helps fill that gap, then why not? <laughs> 